Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the Mike Ray Show. I'm Jack Nolan, joined once again by the head coach of the Fighting Irish. And Mike, a very tough week for your team that started with your guys going into a game against Boston College where all the intangibles favored the opposition unlike any game I've called in my four decades around this program. It was senior day for the BC team, a BC team with nothing to lose in a rivalry that is huge for the Eagles, plus the first game for an interim coach that had two weeks to get ready and had not played a game, so you really did not know what to prepare for other than the unexpected, which is virtually impossible to prepare for. Well, we ran into a buzzsaw. There's no question about it. And, and I think you've got to give Boston College and Scott Spinelli a lot of credit for rallying the troops. They made a coaching change, and he infused new life in them. <clears throat> and they were kind of starting over. And we just couldn't guard them. You know, I, what the disappointing thing is we scored 90 points, uh, but you can't win a game. I mean, if you score 90, you should win a game. And that's been a problem for us. I think the defensive lapses that we had during that 0-5 stretch um, have kind of come back and home to roost. And we're going to have to, you know, do something about that if we want to hang around in Greensboro uh, more than a day. After the BC game, you came home to take on a confident North Carolina State team that's on a four-game winning streak coming into the game, both overall and on the road. Coming in, it was the first time an NC State team had won four in a row on the road since the 1973-74 season, and they added another one in Purcell. I'm very impressed with them. Um, you know, they're playing with an edge. They have men. Their, their physical defense really disrupted us, switching everything and their ball pressure probably made us play a little fast. I think we missed like 15 layups in the game because we were looking around and they have shot blockers. Um, and then on the other end, as it showed its head a little bit at Boston College, I just don't think we have put our chest out in front of people defensively enough. And, and you know, you, you get what you deserve when you don't do that. But, again, I, I've got to give NC State credit. I think they're playing as well, maybe the best of anybody in the league right now. Folks, our friends at NECA want to remind you that they are continuing their efforts to make our community brighter. It's what NECA electrical contractors do every day through donations, volunteer efforts, and by training the next generation of electrical workers through apprenticeship programs. The NECA contractors and electrical workers of Local 153 preparing for a brighter tomorrow. Mike, win or lose on Saturday against Florida State, it will be a special day, as it will be the official senior day. Goodbye for your two graduate student captains, Nick Chogo and Juwan Durham, who are ending their Notre Dame careers playing the best basketball of their lives. Well, two young men that have been with us for a while, you know, five-year guys. Nick's been with us all five, and just beautiful young men. Class acts, great guys. They've been great teammates, and I think they have played their best in their last year. Um, there's no question that Nick coming off the bench for us has been maybe our most there, – there's been no one more consistent in his role than Nick Jogo. And it's been nice to see Jawan Durham kind of reach some potential that we always felt was there. Um, so it'll be – you know, again, I, I feel bad their parents won't be able to – come down on the court and do the usual ceremonies, but we're going to honor them and thank them. They've been great representatives of our program and certainly our university. Nick will get a master's degree in business. Juwan has already graduated, you know, two guys that will represent us for a long time out there in the real world. And on this final show, we're going to go to both ends of the player age spectrum. We just talked about your two graduate student captains playing their last home games. Well, later in the show, we're going to feature one of your young guys, Matt Zona. He's still the reigning New Jersey High School Player of the Year. He earned that last season. They haven't named a new one yet. And he's already proven, Mike, that he has the skill and the physicality to handle ACC basketball. Uh, there's a lot of personality there, too. You know, I think he's a favorite of our older guys on the team because of his personality. There's also a toughness about Matt. You know, he hasn't gotten as much opportunity this year because of the older guys in front of him. But he's going to be a very good player for us because he's tough. He understands how to play and he's play and he has great energy. I just love having his personality as part of our group. 
He's a very eclectic guy. After your home went over Miami, I'm wrapping stuff up in the upper press box, and all of a sudden I hear Frank Sinatra singing my way. It was Zona's music as he went through his shooting drills. He's a huge Sinatra fan. Well, that's the New Yorker in him, right? He's a bit of a throwback. There's no question about it. But a lot of personality, tough kid, great kid, um, has gone after Juwan and Nate in practice every day, which was really kind of his role this year, and mature beyond his years. You know, to be thrown into living off campus and doing things differently as a freshman because of the pandemic – he hasn't missed the beat. He has just continued to move along like a mature young man. Folks, we have a heck of a show lined up for you this week. In addition to talking with Matt Sona, later in the show, Coach Bray will catch up with former Irish star big man, Taryn Francis. This is the Mike Bray Show, presented by Tyrac.com, the ultimate in contactless tire buying. It's time now for our game breakdown, brought to you by our friends at Meyer. Mike, we talked a lot in the opening segment about the many unique and difficult challenges your team faced getting ready for and playing the game at Boston College. And then karma kind of slapped you in the face early when senior BC walk-on Sam Holt, starting because it was senior day, playing in just his third game of the year, hit his first shot attempt of the season, a deep three, to give BC a 3 nothing lead. Well, they had some great karma, to say the least, and, and they were really ready to go. Um and the, whoever started was really ready to play. We had a hard time, you know, getting out to shooters early. Some different guys made shots that maybe you didn't expect, uh, but they played with great emotion and energy because I think they were reinvented by their interim coach, Scott Spinelli, who did a fabulous job. And so now you're digging out of a hole most of the game. And, uh, you know, as I said, we scored 90, but you give up 94, you just don't deserve to win. I mean, after that three by Holtz, your guys hit three of their next four shots. You shot 56% in the first half, 61% in the second half. Shot making, again, certainly not an issue for your team. And that's maybe where this game was confusing. You know, people say they weren't ready, they were flat. You don't score 90 points if you're not playing well and playing with energy and effort. But why was it difficult to maintain that level of execution on both ends of the floor? I think – it was the first game, and we lead the nation in least amount of fouls. It was the first game where we fouled early and often in both halves. And BC got to the bonus quick, got to the line quick, and it, it's really it, – it just – you know, they got a lot of they, – they scored 23 points from the foul line. And we usually average giving up single digits from the foul line. And we just kept – fouling and putting our hands on people and when you get easy points from the foul line it just took too much pressure on our offense even though our offense again I think we shot 56 percent for the game and scored 90 and 17 assists and you're doing all that but 23 points from the foul line was a backbreaker now less than four minutes into the game a young man named Frederick Scott a transfer graduate transfer from Ryder checks into the game the first time he had played since injuring his knee in November. He made his first shot, ended up with eight points in the first half, and 18 for the game, a guy no one other than the folks on the BC team knew was even going to play. Well, Chris Cheek, their uh, assistant coach, told me after the game that they felt he was their best player in the program back in September before the injury. And he certainly played like that. Of course, he was injured. He was off the radar. We didn't have any tape of him. We didn't have any scouting report of him. Um, And we didn't really have any scouting report of how they would play offensively. All we had was Jim Christian's system. Um, And I think between a few new guys and a new system, we were always kind of a step behind until maybe the last 10 minutes of the second half. You know, as the visiting team's radio guy, I don't get to talk to the opposing team's coaching staff. TV guys do. I don't. I wasn't there. I haven't been traveling to your road games this year. So in commercial breaks, I'm Googling the guy, trying to find anything I can about him. And other than he hadn't played since November, there wasn't even anything about it, his injury. So I, I, mean, I can't ever remember basically an anonymous guy coming in and playing that kind of role. It's not an excuse, but it kind of underlines all the things that you were 
up against. And there were some positives. I know it's not showing up in the box score right now, but there were a lot of positives developing on this team now for your future. And one of those positives is Trey Wirtz. He came off the bench five and a half minutes into the first half at BC. He hit all three of his first half shots. He converted a three-point play in the final minute of the half to help you cut what had been a 12-point BC lead down to seven at halftime. And you had to go into the locker room thinking, okay, we got this. Yeah, I, again, and I'm excited about Trey. Uh, you know, he's went from not being eligible to being eligible, and I think he's adjusted that really well and has gotten better. He's gotten stronger. He's gotten more comfortable and more confident, and I, I give him a lot of credit. And, uh, uh, and, he, and he helps take a little pressure off Prentice because he can handle the ball, and we want him to keep attacking and, and keep looking to make plays for us. But, uh, but yeah, we, we were scoring, but we – were fouling and, and didn't move our feet well enough defensively. And so you're just trading buckets uh, and you're down 10 trading baskets. It's hard to make a dent in the thing. And you're right. Your offense was absolutely rolling, but BC came out and shot 65%. And again, your guys, you took responsibility defensively, but they also made a bunch of shots. Yeah, they did. They shot it really well. You got it give them credit. And every time we put a little game pressure on them in the second half, cut it to five or two possessions, six, you know, they made a big bucket or we fouled. And, and, and so to their credit, they made big shots, big plays. Um, we fought, we battled, we pressed, we kind of, kind of got that thing, you know, down to a one possession game, but never really could get enough stops in a row, you know, to score more than them. Cause that's what we were going to have to do. Another bright spot in this game, and you've made it clear for your team to win, everybody's going to play well. So a couple of guys playing well isn't going to get it done. But Prentice Hub did his best on the offensive end to carry your team to victory. He scored 23 of his career-high 28 points in the second half on a combination of three-point bombs and aggressive drives to the basket. He also finished the game with seven assists against just one turnover. On offense, he was as efficient and controlled as he's ever been. Well, I thought he started driving the ball in the second half and it really helped us. You know, he just was having to make plays for us. And, you know, he's done that. I mean, he, you know, uh, the one thing that falls on his shoulders a lot of times if other guys aren't going, he has to kind of jumpstart us. And overall, I think he's done a pretty good job of that. Yet also finding people and, and, and giving up assists. The kid's a warrior. He wants to win. He's ready to play every night. He loves to compete. Um, I, I've loved working with him. So the Irish do go down to a painful defeat in Boston, 94-90 to the Eagles, and return home to host their first two-game homestand of the season in ACC play. Incredible when you think about how much you've been on the road and how little rhythm you've been able to get into from a practice and game perspective this season. Seems like you were always packing. Yeah, that was a love, that was a tough stretch for us to go three in a row on the road and and you and, and you take three losses. I mean, that takes its toll on you. Um, we were looking forward to being back home. We were looking forward to practicing in the arena. We haven't really been in the arena in three weeks. We've kind of stayed out of there just to for COVID reasons, not to cross paths with other people. Um, but Monday and Tuesday, we did get reps on, on our floor. Uh, and we're really looking forward to playing NC State Wednesday. The problem was we ran into maybe the hottest team in the league right now, the way they're playing. 15 seconds into the NC State game, Prentice Hub drives the lane and feeds Juwan Durham for a dunk, but the red-hot Wolfpack answered with nine straight points to take a seven-point lead. You answered with a 7-0 run of your own a little later to tie the game at 11, but it was a little deja vu from that early hole. It was another game where you just seemed to be scrambling and trying to get back into it the whole game. Yeah, I think the combination, Jack, of their athletic defense switching everything and then having shot blockers and, and then having a hard time staying in front of their speed off the dribble. You know, they really have some athletic ability that can go. We tried a little bit of everything defensively. Nothing was able to help us. Uh, they beat us to loose balls and really kind of a thorough beating by some men at NC State and, and disappointing for us because we were coming back home and wanted to invest to get a good win. And, and we just didn't do enough. We didn't do enough tough stuff to, to get it and didn't deserve it. 
The game did remain a two-score game for much of the first half until NC State built an eight-point lead at halftime, a lead that they built with good shooting. And you talk about that defensive effort. It, it wasn't just athletic. What I liked about it is it may have been the cleanest physical defense yeah. I've ever seen. They kind of beat you up, but they did it within the rules. I wasn't saying, oh, that should have been a foul. Or there was no whistle there. They just overpowered you physically. And I think that's probably a, a tribute to Coach Keats. He's really got that team playing well on both ends of the floor. Yeah, he's done a great job. I I mean, I, he'd be my vote for coach of the year in the league, quite frankly. He's been great. And, and uh, But you're right. I mean, they've got athletic ability. They've got speed. And then they've got uh, big guys that can block shots. And so you really can't run your offense. You've got a ball screen and move the ball. And then somebody's got to drive and make a play. And we made a few, but we couldn't make enough. The other problem is they're so quick in transition. If you don't score and, or it's a long rebound, they're coming down on you four on two, four on three, most of the night, and they're really hard to handle. And again, I'm thoroughly impressed with their personnel and their scheme and how they play and how they defend. And we just were holding on for dear life, really, the whole game. One of my barometers for effort is the rebounding stat. You out-rebounded a big athletic NC State team, 42-38, and you had eight offensive rebounds in the first half, 16 for the game, but they didn't make it easy on the putbacks. They blocked 10 of your shots. Yeah, they they were all over the place. I mean, you know, I mean, our guys were fighting and trying, and we knew it was hard to get that first shot to go down because they're so fast and they recover so well. And I thought our guys got to the backboard, Nate, Juwan, Dane, to get us some extra stuff. But you get it in, you know, we missed, I think we missed 15, 16 layups. And that kind of tells you you're looking around for guys that can block shots because they can block shots. The Irish did go on a 12-0 run late in the game, but it was not enough as NC State extended their winning streak to five games with an 80-69 win over the Irish. We'll be back with more of the Mike Gray Show presented by TireRack.com right after this timeout. Hey, Notre Dame fans, Tire Rack is the presenting sponsor of the Mike Gray Show and like the Irish knows a thing or two about passion and performance. Their on-site test track is their home court and they've got a playbook that includes safe, no contact, mobile installation in many areas. Get your tires right at TireRack.com, the way tire buying should be. Our player guest this week, the reigning New Jersey High School Player of the Year, Matt Zona, is wrapping up his first year in the Notre Dame uniform. Last season, Zona led Bergen Catholic High School to a 22-7 record, averaging a double-double with 14.8 points and 11.4 rebounds per game to go with two-and-a-half block shots per contest. He finished his high school career with 1,237 points, the second most in Bergen Catholic history. He earned all Bergen County honors in each of his final three years in high school and was also named the 2020 New Jersey Scholar Athlete of the Year. So far this season, the 6'9 Zona has played a total of 61 minutes in 13 games for the Irish with one start. He has scored 10 points and grabbed 19 rebounds in those 13 games with three blocked shots. Matt, thanks for taking the time to join us this week on the Mike Break Show. Thank you for having me on, Mr. Nolan. You had a lot of options about where you could play your college basketball. Why'd you choose Notre Dame? Uh, I think when I got on campus, I kind of fell in love with the whole school atmosphere we had here. Um, for me, it's a lot more than just basketball. My parents always instilled that in me that, uh, you know, the ball stops bouncing at some point. And when you come to a place like Notre Dame, like uh, beyond basketball, it's all uh, right there for the taking. So the ed education I'm getting here is second to none, I feel like, and it really made it easier for me. So you're in freshman year of studies, but what do you think you're going to major in? Uh, I'm leaning towards finance or uh, management right now. So I know I've heard finance is real hard, but I, I got to see if I'm up for it. I think it is, but everybody who majors in that ends up being pretty darn successful down the road when that basketball career ends. Now, the first time I saw you on a practice court, I thought to myself, there is no way this guy is a freshman. You already have a veteran build and you've already proven you can handle the physicality of Atlantic Coast Conference basketball. Has the physical transition to college basketball been as easy for you as you have made it look so far? Uh, I don't think it's been that easy. I mean, being in the weight room material has definitely been uh, really helpful. I mean, he's getting everyone really uh, right this uh, this season. But uh, coming in, uh, reshaping my body, like uh, 
losing bad weight and uh, putting on good weight, putting on muscle has been really important for me. And uh, I think T Rose helped me to do a really great job with that. Let's flip it the other way. How much bigger, stronger, and faster are the players you go up against this year than your last year in high school? Yeah, it's definitely a lot different. Um, uh, it's all athletes in this conference and everyone knows how to play basketball, but the athletic side of it, guys jump through the roof and are real strong. So it's uh, definitely been an adjustment. Now, three of your first four collegiate games were against college basketball Blue Bloods at Michigan State, your very first game, a home game against Ohio State, and then back on the road against Kentucky. In those three games, you played a total of 20 minutes, scored six points, grabbed six rebounds, and blocked a couple of shots. What was it like to begin your college career against that kind of competition and those historic programs? Uh, I think it was definitely awesome. I mean, it's something I've always kind of grown up and dreamed about, like playing those big games. I mean, it's definitely different than the pandemic this year. There's no fans, but still like getting, uh, giving your best shot at all these best, all the best teams in college basketball. It's always something I want to do. Now we're doing this before uh, you take the floor to take on NC State, but I understand there's going to be students in there cheering for you. What's that going to be like? That will definitely be awesome. I mean, we went down to uh, Georgia Tech was like pretty much the first game where they had students at the games. And that atmosphere was really awesome. So I'm hoping we can emulate something like that. Now, to me, when we talk about that opening three-game blue blood sequence at the beginning of the season, you really stood out against Ohio State. In just seven minutes, you grabbed three offensive rebounds, scored a big bucket in the second half. You also recorded an assist and a steal as Notre Dame almost pulled off that upset. Did that performance have a lasting impact on you? Uh, I think so. I mean, it kind of uh, gave me the confidence that I can, you know, hang hang around here and, uh, you know, play basketball at this level. I'd always had that confidence, but that kind of reassured it. Um, I had to stay ready that game. I didn't – they only got into the game until the last seven minutes of the game. So uh, I definitely just staying ready and, you know, building off of that. Now, I think your most impressive performance to date was playing 18 minutes at North Carolina. Well, you did a little bit of everything, grabbing six rebounds with an assist, a block, and a steal – is that the kind of player you want to be as your career progresses, the kind who does a little bit of everything? Definitely. I mean, whatever we need to win. I mean, unfortunately, we didn't get to win that game, but uh, just kind of – it doesn't really matter about the stats or any of that kind of stuff, just helping my team win. I think that day I had to – I got called on to rebound the ball, and uh, I thought I did a pretty good job of that. Just anything we need to do to win, I want to do. Now, I've also seen you in practice hit some nice jump shots – you can make the three. Are there any players in college or the pros that you pattern yourself after? I mean, there's definitely guys like Luca Garza, someone who I, uh, I try to watch a lot of uh, tape on. Like the way he plays and grown throughout his college career is something that uh, I envy and I'd love to, you know, keep working to be like um, guys in the pro, like Nicole, uh, Nicola jo- uh, Jokic, uh, another guy just a big who can handle the ball, who can pass it, who can shoot, who does a little bit of everything. Uh, those are two guys that I kind of have always looked up to. And then obviously Notre Dame guys like, you know, John Mooney, Luke Karen, uh, looking at how they did things in this system is something I've really enjoyed. I can already tell you're a student of the game, aren't you? Yes, sir. Now I was not in practice before you guys flew down to Miami, but that was the practice where coach Bray said the blue team outperformed and out hustled the white team enough that the blue team earned the start at Miami, your first career start. What was that experience like? Uh, it was definitely awesome. I mean, I'd always, uh, I mean, I didn't think that'd be the first time I'd start. Uh, so it was definitely a, a surprise, but uh, just working hard in practice. That's what we try and do as the blue team, keep those guys ready. Um, but starting in Miami was definitely, it was definitely awesome. I got to be honest. You made me very happy after the home win over Miami, when you came out to do some shooting drills after the game and played Frank Sinatra's my way as your background music. I love Sinatra, but I'm old. When did you become a Sinatra fan? Uh, I've always liked Sinatra. I think uh, the first time I heard My Way was actually a Derek Jeter commercial when he had uh, retired uh, with the Yankees. It was a Gatorade commercial. And then I guess that was like my eighth grade year. And ever since then, that song's always kind of stuck with me, like did it my way. Uh, the lyrics of the song are kind of something that I hold close. And I actually listen to mostly Sinatra before every game. Uh, it just calms me down and keeps me level-headed instead of getting too hyped up for a game. Because I think I manufacture enough energy on my own where I don't need uh, I don't need anything else. Interesting that you mentioned Derek Jeter. I looked at your Twitter feed. Most of your Twitter uh, feeds, most of your Twitter feed is made up of retweets, which means you're a smart social media guy. But yes. from those retweets, I am assuming you're a big Yankees, 
New York football Giants and Knicks fan. Those three, I've cheered for them my whole life. Uh, I'm a diehard for uh, all three, and uh, it's definitely, uh, definitely the Yankees take the take the toss spot for me. Now, I did see a couple of retweets about another athlete who played a little further north than that up in New England, a guy by the name of Tom Brady. Are you a Brady fan too? Uh, I just uh, he's he's greatness personified, in my opinion. So just seeing how he's done things and how uh, he's carried himself is definitely something that. Uh, I, almost, I look up to, I guess you could say. So I definitely cheer for Tom Brady, yes. But now, Eli yeah. Manning beat him twice, so I'm able to – So you can do that. that. You have yeah. dispensation to root for Tom Brady now. If he had beaten the Giants twice, it might be a little different, but Eli <laughs> Manning got the best of them. That's great. Now, you did post a very interesting tweet this past July 4th. Quote, the greatest and most dominant athlete in our country's history has done it again – Number 13, you obviously remember that tweet. Explain it to our listeners and viewers at home. So I have a running joke with all my friends. Uh, we always watch the hot dog eating contest. And Joey Chestnut, it's just his dominance is incredible. So I always uh, joke around with that. I'll send that tweet out every year. And my friends always give me flack for it because I, I always say that he's, he's the most dominant athlete of all time. And I categorize athlete because it's on ESPN. But uh, – he, he, he wins everything. Well, athletes do things that no other human can do or very few can do. And in this case, he ate 75 Nathan's hot dogs in 10 minutes. I know I could not do that probably in a week. I don't think I could either. But uh, I always find July 4th is always fun to watch because it's just so crazy. Now, your dad, Mike, played basketball and baseball at Iona. He started nine basketball games as a 6'5 forward his senior year. What influence has he had on your basketball career? Uh, I think he's had all the influence on my basketball career. I, I mean, from a young age, he's taught me pretty much everything I know. Um, so definitely, like, in the driveway, just rebounding for me and uh, going up to the school and kind of just going through post moves or him watching film with him. It's, uh, he's really been a difference maker for me in my life. This is a tough question to ask you at this point in your life. But in four or five years, when you wrap up your Notre Dame basketball career, what do you hope people will say about Matt Zona? Uh, that I gave 110%. Uh, I think that for me, uh, I can go to sleep at night knowing I gave everything I had. And that's kind of the my like, motto in life. Uh, I think the man in the arena is a quote that I keep with me all the time. And uh, the base of the quote is that uh, – you know, as long as you gave everything you had, like that's, that's half the battle. So I kind of believe in that. And uh, yeah, as long as I give everything I have here, that's all I care about. Now the fun part of the interview, the fast break. And we keep bringing this back because the fans love it. The fans may not realize that the players love it too. And you've been watching and you've noticed that you've been the answer to some questions. And at the end of this, you get your chance to give your answers to those same questions. So this should be fun. But we begin at the top. What's your favorite all-time movie? Good Will Hunting. First car you ever drove? 2016 Subaru. Favorite musical group or artist? Well, Frank Sinatra, but uh, I can change it up with Drake or Jack Harlow. Who's your role model? My parents. And then on the athletic side, it'd be Derek Jeter. One thing the public would be surprised to learn about Matt Zona. I don't know. Uh, I guess I'm a fun guy. I think that's kind of – it's uh, a little evident, but that's kind of something I like to do. Favorite thing to do in relaxing? Uh, sleep. Favorite sport to play other than basketball? Baseball. Favorite part of practice? Compete drill. Worst part of practice? Three-minute shooting. Best part of your game? Uh, my rebounding and my toughness. Those kind of go hand in hand. Part of your game you need to work on? Uh, taking guys off the dribble. City or place in the world you would like to visit? Uh, right now, I want to go back to New York, I think. I miss New York, but uh, definitely Greece at some point. Which is better, a highlight film dunk, blocking a key shot, or grabbing a big rebound? Definitely a highlight film dunk. I know the other two are the answers that you're supposed to give, but <laughs> I'd love to get a dunk. That'd be fun. I know. Dunks can change the entire picture of the game. Nothing wrong with that. Coach Bray will be up there cheering those, too, so don't worry about that. One thing you always hear from Coach Bray in practice. Uh, tough than the year, fellas. Assistant coach, who is most like Coach Bray? I'm going to change it up. I'm going to go Scott Martin. Okay. 
Why? Uh, I think they have the same basketball, uh, kind of like the way they go about practice and stuff, kind of similar. Okay, now I'm going to ask you for a, a one or two word answer to describe the other assistants. So for the first time in a long time, Rod Balanis is in this category. So Rod Balanis. Uh, encouraging. Ryan Humphrey. Uh, it's really smart. Harold Swanigan. Funny. Have you ever seen any of the videos of Swanee setting screens in his day? I have not, but he must have been some screen setter. Oh, there's a couple of Seton Hall guys that didn't get out. So you need to go look for those. I think they're still on YouTube somewhere. Hard. This is a hard question to ask. I guess the toughest place to play in the ACC for you in your first year is probably Georgia Tech. What do you think? Yeah, Georgia Tech would be – I think it's the only answer I could give. Um, yeah. They were pretty loud there. I know that uh, North, like on video it would be North Carolina or Duke or something, but Georgia Tech this year, they had the band going. It was, it was a really good atmosphere. Well, uh, you've got a lot to look forward to because Duke is about a thousand times more than that. So that's going to be interesting for you. Player on the team most like you? Tony. Best nickname on the team and who has it? Um, I think I do. I think Zone, Big Zone. I think I have a good nickname. I like that. Best player to room with? By you default, I have a I got to go Tony Sanders. That's who I've been my roommate all year on the road and uh, here at school. All right. Are you guys rooming on the road now? Yes. Okay. Did you start out with your own rooms? Uh, no, we were kind of all together. Because at that point, me and Tony had already been living together. So they kind of just – All right. We so that's how there. they did it. You'd already been tested. Mm -hmm. okay. Normally, I travel with you everywhere. Not this year. Although, I am going to the ACC tournament. Maybe I'll bring us luck. I hope so. Okay. Best defender on the team? Uh, Cormac or Nick. Toughest Notre Dame player to guard? Juwan. Best leaper on the team? Uh, Robbie. Best dunker on the team? Robbie. Worst dunker on the team? Uh, Trey. Best dresser on the team? Me. I know you're looking forward to this next one. Worst dresser on the team? Everyone else on the team. <laughs> Best singer on the team? Uh... I don't know. This uh, Elijah Morgan. Okay, I mean, this is not a singing team. Yeah, I go actually Elijah Taylor. Elijah Taylor is best singer on the team. Okay, how about worst singer on the team? Tony. Best comedian on the team. Elijah Morgan. Guy who thinks he's funny, but he's really not. Tony. Free throw shooting competition. Who wins, you or Coach Bray? I think I gotta take it. All right. Matt, I will not be calling your games next year, and I'm going to miss that, but I'll be watching. You're going to have a great career. Thank you. Good luck the rest of this season and beyond. Thank you. Congratulations on retirement. Thank you. Folks, we'll return to wrap up this week's Mike Bray Show, presented by Tyrac.com right after this. Time out. Taryn Francis, welcome. Great to catch up. You look great. You look like you could still play. Oh, I can. I can. Yeah, you, you still can, right? You're catch me up. I know you're in New York with your family. You're retired. Catch me up on what's going on with your life and your family. Right now, so you know, I, I was playing up until March of last year when the pandemic hit, and I was actually trapped in Argentina for two year two months. So in oh. in May, I was finally able to make it home safely. And, um, you know, at that time, I was thinking that maybe that was a that was a, a good time for for me to transition into life after basketball. You know, I had an amazing career. I played 14 seasons. I had my family out there with me. We lived all around the world. So I had I had no regrets stepping away from the game at this point in time. You know, my family actually wasn't traveling with me anymore because my kids were older. So my daughter started high school. Uh Mia, my wife, she was working again. So, you know, we, I came home, we, my wife and I, we actually started a, a venture, you know, we had an idea for a couple years and we thought this is the perfect time to, to pursue that idea. And that's how Island Ice was born. You know, I, I could get a little more into it, but um, that was going well. It, it's, it's still going well. We have some great ideas for that, but you know, this whole time I was thinking, what 
am I going to do after? What's next for Turin after basketball? You know, so I right now I actually have a great opportunity. So now I'm working for a company called uh, Network Capital and I'm a, a mortgage banker and I'm loving it so far. You know, so I, I started about a month ago and it's a great company. It's uh, great people, great the office, they actually just opened the office. So the company is out of California, been around for 20 years. So they have uh, experience in the mortgage world. Uh, there's a there's a, an office in Miami. They just opened the office in New York in the World Trade Center. So it's a great opportunity and I'm loving it so far. You know, I love to help people. I love to be able to bring all of my experiences from being all over the world and, and actually playing the game bring that into the workplace, bring that into the corporate world. So it's, it's been great, you know, and that's, I'm back in New York. So it's, it's, you know, it's different. It's different. I haven't actually lived in the States for, I don't know, ever since college, <laughs> ever since college, you know, aside from during the summer, you know, but it's, it's great to start this new step. I'm excited. And uh, it's been great so far. 14 years as a player, that's a great career. And like you said, you did a great job moving all over the world whenever there was the right deal for you. And then, you know, we've had a lot of guys on, uh, and this is our last show of the year, And uh, but we've had a lot of guys on that are in your mode that have kind of into that retirement mode from playing and into the next phase, and they're really transitioning smoothly. I mean, I just – I'm just so proud of you of how you've moved on. You've got your family settled. You've got your business ventures and you're going now. You've got to tell us a little more about Island Ice, your business venture. Yeah. So Island Ice, they are uh, the main idea is Island Ice. They are alcohol infused ices. And so my wife and I, we thought about this idea about three years ago. We were actually eating uh italian ices and we said oh we should add a little bit of liquor on it spice it up make it make it for adults <laughs> so that's how that's how island ice was born and island ice they're actually alcohol infused ices you know so it kind of it kind of takes you back to your childhood but it's it's meant for adults you know so we we're pretty healthy you know so our ices they're all all natural all organic juices um no preservatives no artificial flavors, all top shelf liquor, and we use uh, fresh fruit inside of them. So Island Ice was born because my family is from Jamaica. Mia's family is from Island is from uh, Puerto Rico. So it's the that's, it's the island vibes. Well, it's, they're they're delicious. We've got an amazing feedback, and you know we've done well, and we're looking to expand them. We're looking to actually get them in the islands, get them in resorts, get them on cruise ships. You know once. The world starts moving again, but we have some great ideas for Island Ice. Hey, Turin, we've lost four in a row. Can you send me a case of them? I could really use them. <laughs> Maybe but, I'll uh, come. I could be a reserve. I could be a reserve. I could come hey, help you guys out. Mia, your beautiful wife, Mia, is, is back working in a law firm there yeah. in New York? Yes. Yes, she is. She's actually working with, uh, with Deloitte right now, and uh, she's doing well. She's liking it. You know, she's she's actually trying to get herself established again after traveling for all these years. Mm -hmm. So she's she's amazing. She's one of the smartest people that I know. And I know that she'll she'll be successful. Can you catch us up on your children? You know, now I'm really feeling old because, you know, you just said you have a high school age. I remember being at Tabor Academy like it was yesterday, recruiting you, and you have a high school age child. Catch us up on, on them and what they're into. Yeah, I, I can't believe it myself. I, I still can't <laughs> believe it. So my daughter, Malia, she's 15, and she's she's amazing. She she goes uh she goes to a private school avenues here in New York, which is an amazing school. She's a straight A student. She's a uh, She's head of uh, a few of the a few of the student uh, student groups in her school. She's uh, head of the the black student union in her school. She plays basketball. She does modeling. She she does it all, you know. So she's amazing. She's an amazing daughter, amazing sister, amazing child. Um, 
my two sons, Caden and Tristan, they're both 10 and eight. They are, they are, you know, they're, they're my boys. They're my boys. They, they love to run around. They love to play basketball. Caden is actually going to join Malia next year uh, at her school. And um, the younger one, Anaya, that's my, li- that's my little baby. She's a sassy one. She's six years old. And, uh, you know, she's a baby of the family, you know, so she basically controls everything. And uh, she's, uh, she's great, you know, so it's, it, I, feel, I feel very blessed that I had the opportunity to have them with me throughout all my years playing. You know, I was, I was fortunate to, to, to see them all be born. And uh, I think that the experiences that they had being overseas and learning a couple of different languages, that's definitely, that definitely helped set a foundation, a great foundation for them now, you know? So their transition coming back here to New York has been a smooth one. They're all doing well in school. They've all been, uh, been, been good socially. They all have friends, you know, and, they, and, and all of their friends love to hear about their stories and all their experiences. You know, uh, do you remember this story? Mia, when you were dating, came to South Bend, came to Notre Dame, and you sat in my office, and I met her, and we talked for about 20 minutes, and then you guys left, and I called you back in the office, and do you remember I said, don't you dare screw this up. This woman <laughs> is a star. And do you remember that? Do you remember yeah, that? No, I do. I do. I do, Mom. But the funny thing is that when we met, and, you know, I never really – I wouldn't say it, it's like a love at first sight, Kind of thing. But when we met, I was like, that is going to be my wife, you know, and now 16 years later, you know, 10 years of marriage and four kids later, here we are You're doing better than ever. Uh, you're a great family, man. And, and we're so darn proud of you. How is your mother? Catch us up on your mom. My mother, she's doing well. She's doing well. She's doing well. She's she's still working. She's still working at the same job. She she uh, she's a, a vocational rehab counselor. So. She's helping people with disabilities and counseling them and, and helping them to find work and, and helping them to, to find their way in life, you know? So, you know, I think her, her helping people, that, that's where basically I got my, my desire to want to help people, you know? So, you know, you know how my mother is. She, 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 she's, she's, doing, she's strong and she's doing well. Strong and tough, and she was yes. hard on me. Yes. And I love her. <laughs> Tell her. Tell her I love her and miss her. Tell your family hello. And, and Turin, we're so darn proud of you. And when the country opens up, we want to get you back on campus with your family. But you got to bring me some island ice. Oh, I will bring some island ice. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I've been dying to get my family. I'm, obviously, Mia has seen Notre Dame, but I tell my Children. kids about Notre Dame all the time. You know, we watch games. We've seen Notre Dame basketball games, Notre Dame football games. I've shown them pictures of the campus. I've shown them pictures from when I was in school. So I'm dying to get back. And, you know, now that I'm actually in in the States full time, it, it, will, it will be much easier to do. Well, let's plan on it this summer, Turin. You be safe. Hello to the family. Take care of yourself. We miss you and we're really proud of you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Coach Bray. Thanks for having me, and I can't wait to see to come see you guys catch up. We'll see you soon. Go Irish. All right. Good luck on the rest of the season. See you, buddy. Let, go to work. I know you're working. I'll catch up with you after the season. All right, Coach Bray. Thank Take you. Take care, my man. Proud of you. Thank you. Welcome back to the Mike Bray Show. Coach, one home game left on your schedule, and it is a tough one against the deepest – and most athletic team in the league, the first place, Florida State Seminoles. Well, they are loaded. And, you know, I need to get our guys to understand that they will come after us defensively like NC State. Swarm us, switch, and be athletic. And then they're going to get to the rim and get to the backboard. This is the same kind of athletic ability that that destroyed us, quite frankly, uh, in the NC State game. So we got a chance to up it a little bit here before we go to Greensboro. Um, But, you know, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for our group. You know, we were under 500, but, well, you could say, hey, could this team say they won at Kentucky, won at Duke, and beat Florida State? You know, that may be something to hang their hat on at the end of the season. And you've always been a big believer in karma. Last few weeks, the karma has not been good. But karma always turns at some point. And the karma for your team in Greensboro 
is pretty darn good. You're four and one there all time. You won the ACC tournament there. And last season, you ended the season with a win over Boston College in the ACC tournament before the pandemic shut everything down. Well, we, we do like Greensboro. We have unbelievable memories uh, uh, of Greensboro in 2015. And you're right, last year when we beat Boston College, we were playing our best basketball of the year. We finished nine and four, you know, to, to get to that spot. So, um, you know, our veteran guys know that there is some good memories there. I'm going to remind everybody of the good memories. We're going to show some video of, of 2015 because – you know, for us to dream big dreams, you got to get a run on Greensboro to play after Greensboro. Mike, as always, thank you for all of the effort and enthusiasm you brought to the show this season and over the past 21 years. Didn't matter if you were 0-2 or 2-0, and you always brought it, you were honest, and it's been a pleasure working with you. Well, Jack Nolan, I am going to miss you. You are a good friend, and it's hard to believe 21 years of shows are over. Uh, all these shows, all the sidebar discussions, the friendship, um, you are a true professional. You made this show a class act. Uh, and I always enjoyed uh, engaging with you, whether it was 2-0, and 1-1, oh, and one, or like this week, the dreaded 0-2. Oh well, we won't get to do this next year, but I've always been – very cautious about texting you so that I wouldn't bother you, but I am now going to be blowing up your phone on a regular basis. You better blow up my phone, and I want you to know we will be coming to visit you in Florida very soon. And we'll be here in the summer, so we'll be around. Folks, I invite all of you to join me in tuning in every week when this show returns next season. Until then, for Coach Gray, I'm Jack Nolan. Thanks so much for tuning in all season long. For all the support all these years, please stay safe in this pandemic. And as always, go Irish.